heroic battle for many years. He was an extraordinary person, uh, certainly a success in business, but took his wealth and used it to help others in a dramatic fashion. He was particularly smitten with the Himalayas and Dalai Lama, and he created a Himalayan foundation to try to spare some of the people who live in that region the worst aspects of poverty. Uh, Richard was an exceptional man, and uh, I know that Senator uh, Feinstein is sad, as she should be, but we are happy to have known him and to have uh, seen his vision of the world. Secondly, uh, as everyone knows, I'm sure President Biden announced his Supreme Court nominee last Friday. We submitted the Senate Judiciary Committee questionnaire uh, to her and received the response last night. It's a lengthy questionnaire. It includes reference to 578 opinions that she handed down on the D.C. District Court. It's a, an ample display of her jurisprudence and her philosophy, which all members now have a chance to look at again in detail. We last considered her uh, less than a year ago in the same committee for the uh, circuit court position. And uh, having said that, I'll read the opening statement for this hearing and thank all the witnesses for being here. Today, our committee is going to consider how the federal government can help prevent and respond to the surge in carjacking. So carjacking is a scourge. To be sitting in your car with your family and have a person stick a gun in your face and force you get, to get out so they can steal the car, that's a situation no American should have to face. Sheriff Tom Dart is here from Cook County. He's read the stories that I read regularly. One time, a young man, very young, with a gun, got in a car and forced the driver out and drove away with the car. He was stopped. He was 11 years old. 11. This sort of thing is incredible. Experts have pointed to a number of factors that may have contributed to the increase in, in violent crime, including economic and social disruption by the pandemic and a large increase in firearm sales. But there is no evidence, none, that an increase in carjacking is due to any specific administration policy or due to bipartisan criminal justice reform legislation signed into law by President Donald Trump. In fact, of 9,000 individuals released to home confinement under the CARES Act, only eight have been returned to prison for committing a new crime and only one for committing a violent crime. Let me be clear, the increase in carjacking started during the last administration and continues in this administration. It is impacting communities led by both Democratic and Republican elected officials. It is not a red problem, not a blue problem, it's an American problem. I've reached across the aisle to work on bipartisan solutions to protect the American people, like the Violence Against Women Act re reauthorization, and I hope we can do that again on this issue. It's important to note that preventing and prosecuting violent crime is primarily a state and local responsibility, but there is an important role for the federal government. First, we need more information on the prevalence of this crime. We can't solve the problem if we don't understand it. That's why I've called for the FBI and Justice Department to begin nationwide data collection on carjacking. Last December, I held a Judiciary Committee field hearing in Chicago on preventing violent crime. I heard from U.S. Attorney John Losh, who is a holdover from the previous administration, about some of the challenges in bringing federal carjacking cases. Senator Grassley and I are working on bipartisan legislation to address it. But as we've learned in the so as in the so-called war on drugs, you can't incarcerate your, your way out of the problem. One important step may involve the auto industry to collaborate with law enforcement on steps that will deter carjackers. Sheriff Dart brought this to my attention. I thank you, Tom. You've always been looking ahead to issues, and this was one that you spoke out on. In January, I wrote to the Department of Transportation and the auto industry to urge the development of uniform standards for swift law enforcement access to vehicle location tracking data in the crucial minutes after a carjacking. If they are more likely to get caught and if there are higher barriers to selling a carjack vehicle, potential carjackers may think twice. We also need to ensure that local law enforcement has the resources to fight carjacking. The American Rescue Plan, which Congress passed last year, included $350 billion to state and local governments. We made sure that part of the funding went to law enforcement and investing in community violence intervention programs. President Biden's budget request called for significant funding increasing for law enforcement groups like Burn JAG and COPS grants. We must work together to across the aisle to get the appropriations bill still pending for the, this fiscal year, which we're in, across the finish line. I hope we can do that 
soon, a matter of days. We also need to ensure that President's well-qualified U.S. attorney and U.S. marshal nominees are swiftly confirmed. Hard to imagine we have one senator is holding up U.S. attorneys and U.S. marshals on a random basis because of some grievance he has over receiving a letter from the Department of Justice. That isn't fair to law enforcement, and it isn't fair to the communities that they would represent. We need to get to the root causes that would drive a young person to engage in carjacking, preventing trauma and helping kids deal with trauma they've experienced, improving social services, diverting children from criminal justice systems to programs that give them a chance. These kids, as bad as the stories are, came to the earth in the usual way, and their lives took a dramatic turn for the worse, and maybe through no fault of their own. I'm glad Vaughn Bryant from the Metropolitan Family Services in Chicago is here. It's a great organization. He's going to tell us about their efforts. Today, we'll hear from a distinguished panel of witnesses who will talk about government, industry, and community leaders as part of the solution. I turn now to my friend and ranking member, Chuck Grassley. The first thing I would say in regard to what Senator Durbin said about Senator Feinstein's loss of her husband, I would associate myself with his remarks but I also personally know in my working with her when she was ranking member of this committee and I was chairman and also for even longer years of working with her as uh, uh, co-chairs of the drug caucus that uh, this has been a burden for her in recent years and we can't help but have uh, uh, sympathy for what she's going through right now and what she has gone through and uh, I think that it's appropriate what you said. And then in regard to Judge Jackson, I would like to speak to Republicans about that. Uh, one little aspect of that is that I don't know how many of our 50 Republicans want to have a meeting with uh, uh, Judge Jackson. I'm going to have my meeting with her, I think, on Wednesday. Uh, but uh, other people, either through me or through your own actions, Make sure that if you want to have a meeting, uh, you say that early so we don't get uh, criticized for stringing people along just to stretch out what might be seen as, as uh, uh, not moving quickly enough. I think you ought to let uh, the White House know if you want to meet with them. I thank you, Chairman Durbin, for holding this hearing. This is an important and serious topic, and Congress has an important role to play in combating the rise of violent crimes, and carjacking is just one of them. People often confuse carjacking with motor vehicle theft, but carjacking is much more dangerous. We're not talking about having a car stolen from some parking lot. We're talking about when someone uses violence or the threat of violence to take control of a car from someone else. Uh, for example, cars are being taken from parents at gunpoint while their child's still in the vehicle. A member of the Illinois legislature was in the car with her husband when masked men with guns ordered them out of their car. She begged them not to shoot her and her husband and their lives were only saved when her husband returned fire. These carjackers form what are referred to as booster crews that have strategically figured out where to commit carjackings, how many uh, to commit to the project so that they can overwhelm the local police, and which kind of cars uh, to target. Hijacked cars are then being used by gangs and criminal organizations. They use fake license plates to disguise the cars and then use them as getaway cars to commit other crimes. Carjackings uh, directly feed the nationwide surge of other crimes. The increase in this violent crime of carjacking is part of a very disturbing trend nationwide. Murders rose 30% in 2020. And early data suggests murders rose again by at least 10, uh, 10% 10 2021. And of course, that's thousands of lives needlessly lost. Attacks on law enforcement are up. 
Police officers recorded the highest number of on-duty deaths in 2021 since 1995, excluding the 9-11 attacks. Law enforcement groups nationwide are struggling to find high-quality uh, local recruits to join their force. It's time to start looking for solutions to different parts of this crime wave. Operation Legend was extremely successful by providing federal manpower in overwhelmed cities. Some, like Mayor Lightfoot of Chicago, have requested similar federal uh, resources. Productive or proactive policing, I guess that's also productive policing, but proactive policing and increasing the number of available law enforcement officers are are a part of the solution and an important part, but not the only part. Expanding the toolkit of federal prosecutors could also be an effective resource and an effective res uh, response. I'm looking at expanding the reach of federal carjacking statute. Progressive prosecutors at the state level have told criminals that they won't get in trouble with certain crimes. Well, that won't fly with the federal government. This hearing on carjacking is a good start, and I look forward to more hearings on violent crime issues, such as violent crime against law enforcement and homicide spike. I look forward to focusing as a body on different areas of violent crime and how we in Congress can solve it. It is also critical that we exercise our important oversight authority of federal agencies involved in monitoring and in reducing crime. Obviously, that's the Justice Department for one. Congress needs to know if what the DOJ is currently doing is making enough of an impact on crime and safety. We also need oversight so that we can redirect misfocus energy and resources. Spending government resources on the so-called iron pipeline, ghost guns, and lawful uh, firearm dealers isn't going to help bring crime uh, statistics down. These uh, liberal priorities affect a tiny fraction of overall crimes. We should be pursuing policies that will actually make an impact on the massive crime surge. Thanks to our witnesses for being here today and the hard work you put in, into your testimony. Thanks, Senator Grassley. We have six exceptional witnesses. Let me give you a brief introduction on, on the witnesses. First one is Tom Dart, Sheriff of Cook County, the elected Sheriff of Cook County. He served in that capacity since 2006. Prior to that, he was an Assistant State's Attorney in Cook County and a member of the Illinois House of Representatives, earned his undergraduate degree from Providence College, his law degree from Loyola University of Chicago. Justin Herdman, is the former U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Ohio, served as Vice Chair of the Attorney General's Advisory Committee, currently a partner of Jones Day, specializes in government investigation, criminal, and civil lit litigation, currently serves as Judge Advocate in the U.S. Air Force Reserve, a graduate of Ohio University, University of Glasgow, and Harvard Law School. Vaughn Bryant, Executive Director of the Metropolitan Peace Initiatives in Chicago, part of the Metropolitan Family Services. At MPI, he oversees a team working with neighborhood and citywide organizations to coordinate and sustain comprehensive services to heal communities that have experienced gun violence. Vaughn Bryant has received his BA from Stanford, master's from Northwestern, previously served in managerial positions in the uh, NFL, Chicago Public Schools, and Chicago Park District. I understand, I understand Senator Cornyn would like to introduce our next witness, Chief Eddie Garcia of the Dallas Police Department. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm happy to welcome uh, Chief Garcia uh, here to the Senate. Uh, we were together just last week um, talking about the Right Care Initiative there in, in Dallas where uh, uh, mental health professionals deploy with uh, police officers and social workers to try to de-escalate people with mental health crises and, and uh, divert them to appropriate treatment as opposed to just uh, simply putting them in, in jail. Um, 
Chief Garcia spent 29 years as a patrol sergeant, night detective, and homicide investigator in San Jose before being appointed in February of 2021 as the 30th, 30th police chief of the Dallas Police Department. He studied administration of justice at De Anza College in Cupertino, California, and earned a Bachelor of Science degree in criminal justice management from Union Institute and University. In his three decades of serving and protecting our streets, Chief Garcia has built a reputation as one who leads by example. He considers himself a blue collar chief who regularly patrols with new recruits and young officers. Since his appointment, um, Chief Garcia has focused on reducing violent crime in Dallas and has had measurable success. Under his leadership, Dallas police have strategically engaged specific high crime communities, focusing on the most serious and violent offenses. As a result, Dallas has recently seen a significant reduction in crime in both high crime areas and in the city overall. Since May 2021, the city's murder rate has dropped by 27%, aggravated assaults by 6.5%, robberies by 28%, and overall violent crime by 13%. These statistics speak for themselves. While other cities are experiencing spiking crime waves uh, that they've not seen in 30 years, I'm proud of the good work that the chief has done in the Dallas Police Department, along with the, the mayor and the city council there in Dallas to promote um, smart policing and public safety. Uh, sometimes uh, we refer to the states as the laboratories of democracy. That's what uh, Justice Brandeis referred to but I think the cities can be also laboratories where we can demonstrate what works and what doesn't work. And I think there's a lot to learn, a lot the rest of the country could learn from the leadership of Chief Garcia and the Dallas police. Uh, while some other major cities have succumbed to the siren calls of defunding the police, uh, Dallas took the opposite approach, increasing funding and support for the department and police officers. Before I turn the floor over to him, I want to thank you, Chief, for your presence here today, as well as all of the other witnesses. I want to thank you for your service and your testimony. State and federal collaboration is vital as we seek to address the issues of violent crime in America, and we could not do our jobs without our state law enforcement officers' service to our communities. And my staff reminds me that uh, one of the components uh, that we've used at the federal level uh, through the Attorney General's office is the Safe Project Safe Neighborhood uh, effort to get uh, felons in possession off the streets and to prosecute uh, violent gun crime, which I know has been, uh, has been uh, contributed to some of the success in Dallas. So thank you for being here and thanks to all of the witnesses for being here and for your contribution for our efforts to try to address these serious public safety concerns. Thanks, Thanks. Senator Cornyn. John Bazella is the president and CEO of the Alliance for Automotive Innovation, previously served as president and CEO of the Association of Global Automakers after holding senior positions with Ford and Chrysler. Prior to joining the automotive industry, Mr. Bazella served as New York City's director of state legislative affairs, began his career in public policy as director of legislative and political action for the United Federation of Teachers and a graduate of Cornell University. David Glowey is president and CEO of the National Insurance Crime Bureau. He previously served as Under Secretary of Homeland Security for Intelligence and Analysis, and before that as Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Homeland Security at the White House. He served as Special Agent with the FBI, including as a Supervisory Special Agent in the Counterterrorism Division, before that as an agent with the U.S. Postal Inspection Service, and as Police Officer in Houston, Texas, and Aurora, Colorado. I thank the witnesses for coming here today. The mechanics are uh, pretty straightforward in this committee. We'll swear in the witnesses. Each has five minutes for an opening statement. Then each senator will have five minutes to ask questions. So first, let me ask the witnesses to please stand and raise your right hand. Do you affirm the testimony you're about to give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to so help you God? Let the record reflect that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative, so we're going to let them proceed. And our first witness is Sheriff Tom Dart. Thank you so much, uh, Senator. Good morning, uh, Senator and Ranking Member Grassley and members of the committee. 
Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I firmly believe there are tangible ways local law enforcement, the federal government, and the auto industry can work together toward real solutions that will stop the disturbing rise in carjackings. I am the sheriff of Cook County, Illinois, which includes Chicago and more than 130 suburbs. In our community, carjackings have increased at an alarming rate. In Chicago, they tripled over the last decade. Just last year, there were more than 2,000 carjackings, or about one every four hours. This isn't just a Chicago issue. New York City had quadrupled in the last three years. Philadelphia incidents are up nearly 300% since 2015. And here in the District of Columbia, carjackings have almost tripled in the past two years. Anyone in a car is a potential victim. You, your spouse, your children, your parents. And yes, even lawmakers. As Senator Grassley mentioned earlier, a state senator from Illinois, uh, Kimberly Lightford, she was carjacked. Uh, Pennsylvania Congresswoman Mary Kay uh, Gay Scanlon was carjacked as well. The crime can happen at any time. One victim in Chicago told us that she was performing the common winter chore of brushing snow off her Toyota Camry when two men approached, pointed a gun, and demanded her keys. In another case, a retired Air Force position stopped at a gas station in a Chicago suburb. A carjacker uh, grabbed her car door, put a gun to her head, and demanded she get out. A struggle ensued. The offender violently pulled her from the driver's seat, threw her to the ground, and kicked her multiple times before speeding off in broad daylight. These two women are among the more than 4,000 victims in Cook County since 2020. I can give you that number because our office has cataloged and analyzed nearly 4,000 carjacking events since 2020. We've done a deep dive in the methods and tactics of the offenders. With the valuable assistance of the Chicago Police Department and the FBI, we have begun to understand the motivation behind this crime and ways to address it. But regardless of whether the motive is for assisting in committing another crime or for resale, one thing is certain. The key to successful apprehension and prosecution is recovering the vehicles quickly. One of the most effective tools available is manufacturer-installed geolocation equipment commonly available in most vehicles built after 2015. But while some manufacturers are very helpful, others can be reluctant or unwilling to track carjacked vehicles. It is often not clear who to call to get information, and some auto companies have limited hours. Sometimes staff are poorly trained and demand we obtain warrants, which are clearly not relevant. In egregious cases, the companies require customers to pay an upcharge to initiate the tracking of the car, which was just stolen from them. The Air Force veteran I mentioned earlier tried to get her vehicle tracked through the manufacturer with no success. After my office got involved, it still took nearly two days to get the vehicle's location, and while it was at large, the car was used in at least two other crimes, including another carjacking at gunpoint. We believe auto manufacturers can be a great ally in this battle, they already innovated the technologies needed to track the stolen vehicles. Now they must lead the way in developing a system to communicate in a consistent way with responding law enforcement. Just a few weeks ago, we had a great example of how the system should work. After a Chicago woman was carjacked, she initially had problems getting tracked. Our office was able to coordinate a call with her and Toyota for her to, get, to grant our office permission to track the vehicle after having to pay $8, though. Once the location was established, we were able to quickly and safely recover her vehicle. In December, I wrote to major auto manufacturers to raise this issue and suggest a single 24-7 phone number police could use to get tracking data quickly and legally on any hijacked vehicle. We've had some promising discussions since then. General Motors OnStar has been very receptive to our requests and initiated the development of a streamlined communication system. Also, we've had substantive conversations with the Alliance for Automotive Innovation as well. Though talks are ongoing, the Alliance has indicated a willingness to work towards uh, sustainable solutions. But time is of the essence. This is a crime that has real economic impact. Central business districts in major cities across the nation are experiencing a slower than expe uh, expected post-pandemic rebound, in part because diners and shoppers are afraid because of being carjacked. This is certainly the case in Chicago. Chairman Durbin understands this. He is urging the U.S. Department of Transportation to work with the auto industry to increase police access to tracking data, and he's encouraged the FBI and Bureau of Justice Statistics to improve data collection. Make no mistake, this is a violent crime done primarily to obtain an anonymous car to commit more acts of violence, frequently shootings. Carjackings are reasonably easy, easy to commit and uh, difficult for us to prosecute. I'm a former prosecutor, and I can tell you firsthand, the quicker we can get that vehicle, the less chance it'll be used in another crime, and the more likely we'll be able to convict somebody. The longer it takes, the less likely we can convict anyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you today. Thanks, Sheriff.
Mr. Herdman. Good morning. Thank you, Senator Durbin. Thank you, Senator Grassley. And thanks to the committee for the opportunity to speak to you today on the vital issue of federal responses to carjacking. My name is Justin Herdman, and from 2017 until early 2021, I served as the United States Attorney for the Northern District of Ohio, which is comprised of Ohio's 40 northernmost counties, including my hometown of Cleveland. Now, unfortunately, violent crime has increasingly touched all types of communities over the past several years, but it is in our major cities where the most profound violent crime problems continue to plague our nation. And while many of these cases are best prosecuted on the local level, there are certain categories of violent crime that call for a heightened federal prosecutorial response. Within the past several years, I have seen a greater need for expansion of federal law enforcement activity and overall will to prosecute carjacking. Let me first offer a view from my seat as the U.S. Attorney in Cleveland. The city has witnessed a recent surge in all violent crime, but carjacking increased at a particularly alarming rate. Based on publicly available data, Cleveland experienced 285 carjackings in 2019. This number shot up to 355 in 2020, an increase of 25%, and went up to 433 carjackings in 2021. Thus, the overall number of carjackings in 2021 was over 50% higher than it was just two years before, with a carjacking being committed on average more than once per day. Obviously, behind each of these frightening numbers are victims who are forever changed by the crimes committed against them. In the summer of 2020, I highlighted one such case when we announced the expansion of Operation Legend, a comprehensive federal law enforcement initiative to the city of Cleveland. On the night of May 25, 2020, 17-year-old Eric Hakizimana was returning home from soccer practice when he was senselessly murdered in a carjacking. Eric's family had fled to Cleveland as refugees from war-torn Congo, only to see their son murdered during a violent takeover of his vehicle. And on New Year's Eve this past year, 25-year-old Shane Bartek, an off-duty Cleveland policeman, was shot and killed during a carjacking. The individuals arrested in that incident had numerous prior arrests for vehicle-related thefts and robberies. These two tragic cases are among hundreds of other carjacking offenses committed in Cleveland that, while not always involving injury or death, still pose outsized risks to the public. And the reason for this is fairly obvious. Any robbery involves the use of force and therefore is a serious violent crime. But here, the object that is being taken is itself in motion and poses a variety of dangers. This fact requires the perpetrator to act quickly with an overwhelming display or use of force in order to obtain compliance from the victim. And based on my experience as U.S. Attorney, I believe that the likelihood of force actually being used in a carjacking is much higher than in other violent crimes, which makes this a particularly pernicious form of offense. Carjacking is also a facilitation crime. While there are clearly many examples of the robbery being committed for the purposes of, quote, joyriding, in my experience, the vehicle that has been carjacked is most likely to be used for committing additional violent crimes, most notably premeditated shootings or aggravated robberies. This fact also means that carjackings tend to be committed in serial fashion, usually by more than one person. And one last general point that I would offer for the committee involves the prevalence of juvenile offenders in committing these crimes. For instance, in March of last year, a group of 10 teenagers, ranging in ages from 14 to 19 years old, were arrested for a series of 30 armed carjackings and other violent robberies in Cleveland. Now, for purposes of fashioning effective federal responses to the crime of carjacking, I offer the following specific suggestions. First, the addition of a conspiracy offense to the federal carjacking statute, which is Title 18, Section 2119, um, would allow for a, this would allow for an appropriate expansion of federal prosecutions aimed at preventing carjackings before they occur. Second, prioritizing carjacking responses in the current planning for violent crime reduction by federal investigative agencies, especially in violent crime task forces that are staffed by federal, state, and local law enforcement. I would also encourage a similar planning process to be undertaken nationwide by the Department of Justice in order to identify assets and resources that could be deployed to assist cities dealing with a rash of carjackings. Third, and related to what I've just said, I think it'd be very important to develop a nationwide best practices for carjacking response investigations that could be provided to every big city patrol officer and detective. And fourth, the issue of juvenile offenders is one that does not necessarily weigh in favor of expanded federal prosecution. The prosecution of juvenile carjacking offenders will continue to be handled primarily by state and local authorities. But since many of the most violent juvenile offenders will have had prior contact with the criminal justice system, there is a place for smart screening of the highest risk offenders 
ensuring there are robust reentry and rehabilitation services available to those youth. And once again, I thank the committee for an opportunity to address this critical issue of national importance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Herdman. Mr. Bryant. Uh, good morning, Chairman Durbin, our Ranking Member Grassley, and members of the committee. My name is Vaughn Bryant. I am the Executive Director of Metropolitan Peace Initiatives, a division of Metropolitan Family Services. Metropolitan Ser Family Services has helped Chicago families meet the hardships of poverty, epidemics, natural disasters, war wars, economic down and economic downturns since 1857. In 2016, we formed Metropolitan Peace Initiatives to put power in communities' hands and engage residents to participate in the solution of gun violence. I came to this work having grown up in Detroit, Michigan. I am the son of a Detroit police officer. I am the product of police at the Police Athletic League where police officers coached me in football and basketball and baseball before I became a fourth round draft pick in the NFL draft in 1994. I have spent half my professional career in service to communities and working in partnership with law enforcement. It is my privilege to introduce to you Metropolitan Peace Initiatives, which coordinates, supports, and sustains a cross-agency community safety infrastructure made up of local community-based organizations rooted in the most violent areas in the city of Chicago. For the first time in Chicago's history, organizations with proven violence prevention outcomes across the city's geographies have come together to build a necessary community infrastructure dedicated to preventing violence and delivering a comprehensive set of services to heal communities at highest risk for violence and provide opportunities for individual rehabilitation. Chicago's fast escalating violence in 2016, which saw 762 individuals killed by guns and 4,580 uh, 4, individuals shot, an increase of 58 and 47 percent respectively, along with unre unrest, the unrest related to uh, the murder of Laquan McDonald, demanded a new approach. This led a group of local leaders to establish Communities Partner for Peace, which we call CP4P. CP4P began in partnership with eight community-based organizations to reduce violence in nine of the most violent neighborhoods in Chicago. Today, it includes 14 partner agencies active in 28 Chicago communities. The program targets individuals at most risk uh, for perpetuating violence or being a victim and provides intervention by trained street outreach workers who engage individuals with high likelihood to be shot, to, to shoot or be shot and create peace and non-aggression agreements, provide case management services to address any so social determinants of health, uh, community-based events uh, that we held three times a week in the summertime, once a month, fall, winter, spring. We also administer the Metropolitan Peace Academy, a multidisciplinary platform that provides trainings to professionalize and strengthen the field of street outreach and community violence prevention. It features an 18 week, 144 hour intensive curriculum shaped and taught by street outreach workers and guided by 14 professional standards. Since the start of CP4P in July, 2017, shootings and homicides declined an average of 1% per month in our target areas where shootings and homicides were increasing 2% per month before CP4P. This led to an overall reduction of 17.7% on average in the number of homicides and shootings per month in the first 30 months of operation. This is all obviously pre-COVID numbers. According to the City of Chicago's Office of Violence Prevention uh, dashboard, there have been roughly 2,000 vehicular hijacking victimizations in Chicago since January 2021. We saw a slight drop in carjackings in the wards we served. However, we did not get the funding to formalize the initiative and properly evaluate the impact. We funded uh, three different organizations to work across 16 wards uh, on a carjacking initiative. Um, but it's something that we would love to carry forward move, moving forward. Um, a history of slavery, convict leasing, Jim Crow, uh, housing discrimination, mass incarceration has taken its toll. Chicago remains one of the most segregated cities in the United States. Public trust in our institutions continues to suffer because of bad actors such as police commander John Burge, found guilty of torturing approximately 120 people and coercing confessions. Operation Greylord 
is an FBI case where 92 officials faced indictment and many convicted, including Judge Tom Maloney for taking bribes or fixing murder cases. The recent shootings of Laquan McDonald, Anthony Alvarez, and Adam Toledo have police community relations at an all-time low. Recognizing that any successful approach to crime reduction includes both violence prevention and trusted community partners with law enforcement, CP4P created community, the Community Training Academy along with the Chicago Police Department and community-based organizations. Uh, Let's see. The Community Training Academy provides a curriculum for community-based and community-specific trainings for probationary officers and district coordination officers and officers recently transferring to a district. Through a 24-hour curriculum, every police district learns to apply hyperlocal lens to communities they serve. To date, we have trained 100 officers across eight police districts since October 2020. Based on our survey results, 95% of the officers have had a positive experience in the training and recommend all CPD officers complete the training. Additionally, CP4P meets bi-monthly on a bi-monthly basis with local police commanders to identify local violent hotspots, coordinate interventions, and address quality of life issues. Law enforcement cannot provide the healing that comes from social service support and interventions, but can work in tandem with the violence prevention infrastructure that provides options to steer youth in alternative directions. CP4P's community-based infrastructure is a vital part of a larger necessary crime reduction ecosystem. As you consider ways the federal government can address issues of violent crime, sustainable funding that brings violence prevention to scale must be a part of the solution. Thank you for your time today. I look forward to answering any questions. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Bryant. Chief Garcia. Thank you, Would you make sure you're on? There we go. Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Grassley, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's hearing. I appear before you today as the Chief of Police of Dallas, Texas, and it is also my privilege to testify on behalf of Major City Chiefs Association. We're here today to discuss the rise in carjackings occurring throughout the country. This trend is part of a larger increase in violent crime, which has disproportionately impacted MCCA members. Despite immense challenges, our brave officers continue to work tirelessly to keep our communities safe. The most recent MCCA violent crime report clearly shows that America is in the midst of a violent crime wave. In major cities nationwide, homicides in 2021 were approximately 49, up approximately 49% compared to 2019 and 53% compared to 2018. Like other types of violent crime, carjacking has continued to rise. In several cities, the rates have more than doubled over the past few years. A few factors are driving this increase. These include financial gain, but mostly to further other criminal violent activity. Many of these carjackings are also committed by juveniles seeking to gain notoriety on social media or as part of gang initiations. Identifying and preventing this act of violence before it occurs and holding these individuals accountable is the best course of action. Despite the rise in crime, violent and chronic offenders continue to cycle through the criminal justice system. DAs at times are reluctant to prosecute certain crimes, including some violent and gun crimes. And judges continue to release violent and repeat offenders pretrial. These challenges extend to juveniles offenders as well. Make no mistake, please, the general lack of accountability nationwide is contributing to the increase in violent crime and carjacking. Recruitment and retention remain challenging and understaffing has contributed to officer burnout. At the executive level, since January 2020, more than half of MCCA's member agencies have also experienced a change in leadership. Such frequent turnover is detrimental to public safety overall and can make it incredibly difficult to institute reform or culture change. The current outlook in Dallas is not akin to other major cities, and while some other cities have seen record, seen record homicides, my city has experienced a decrease, and it's not by chance. The reduction in violent crime we've seen in Dallas would not be possible without the support of our city government, the exemplary work of the men and women and staff of the Dallas Police Department, and criminologists from the University of Texas San Antonio. And I'd like to take a moment to use this platform to publicly thank them and their sacrifice for the incredible work that they do every day to keep the residents of the city of Dallas safe. Our crime fighting strategy is centered on a violent crime reduction plan. The plan relies heavily on science and crime data and was developed in conjunction with criminologists, Drs. Mike Smith and Drs. Rob Tillier from the University of Texas San Antonio. 
The short-term strategies of the plan focus on hotspots policings based on crime analysis and mapping. We've broken the city down into approximately 101,000 microgrids and deployed a highly visible presence to 50 of those crime grids. These 50 represent approximately 10% of the city total's violent crime. This mix of engagement and enforcement with our community has driven down violent crime in these grids by 50% and ultimately violent crime as a whole citywide. The plan's midterm strategies consist of place network investigations. Dallas PD works with other stakeholders to mix traditional law enforcement actions with other efforts on locations criminogenic nature by strengthening the neighborhood and reinvesting in the community. The longer term strategies included in the plan emphasize focused deterrence to change behavior of high risk offenders. These efforts include the provision of services, community violence interventions when and when necessary enforcement action. Violent crime in Dallas decreased in 2021 and is down roughly 17% again year to date. Given the successes of the work of the men and women of the Dallas Police Department, I strongly encourage fellow chiefs to work in conjunction with criminologists to develop their own violent crime plan that meets the unique needs of their community. Many MCCA members are already working with our federal partners to address violent crime and carjacking. These efforts should be expanded. Victim services as well as programs such as Project Safe Neighborhoods will be critical and must be adequately resourced. MCCA members have found pursuing federal charges for violent criminals to be a successful strategy and a powerful deterrent. To support these efforts, Congress must help build capacity of the U.S. Attorney's Office to support additional prosecutions as appropriate. Proactive policing is critical and will be key to reducing violent crime overall, which will help drive down carjackings. Unfortunately, proactive policing in some cities has become a luxury, especially for local police departments contending with high murder rates, low staffing, and low morale. Law enforcement needs more resources to bolster its response to violent crime. Much of the recent federal assistance provided localities is not being used for law enforcement purposes. Congress should strongly consider, consider private, providing additional assistance and must fully fund important grants such as COPS and the Burn JAG. Continuing anti-law enforcement rhetoric has left honorable officers feeling vilified and criminals, offenders often bolstered. Support for law enforcement for our elected leaders has never been more vital. The support of the mayor and the city council have been integral in Dallas's efforts to reduce violent crime. Reform and proactive public safety are not mutually exclusive. And without the support of the work and sacrifices of our men and women, no plan will be successful. In closing, the successes we've had reducing violent crime in Dallas demonstrates how our communities are safer and more prosperous when investments are made, police officers are supported, and stakeholders work together. I look forward to any questions the committee may have. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Mr. Brazella. Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Grassley, and distinguished members of the committee, on behalf of the Alliance for Automotive Innovation and our members, I thank you for the opportunity to appear today to share my perspective on the troubling rise in carjackings and the auto industry's work to be a constructive voice in the broader efforts to address this challenge. Despite vehicles incorporating increasingly advanced safety features every year, over the past two years, roadway fatalities have increased dramatically. According to the latest data, the first nine months of 2021 saw a 12% increase compared to the same period in 2020. We look forward to continuing engagement with the administration on a safe systems approach to improving safety on our roadways. This model, which acknowledges a shared responsibility and promotes a holistic approach to safety, may offer a guide for examining other complex challenges. Another disturbing trend over the past two years has been the increase in carjacking across the United States. I came to appreciate the full scope of this challenge following outreach to our members from Sheriff Dart of Cook County, Illinois, to request assistance in addressing the rise in carjackings, including tracking these vehicles in real time. We quickly engaged with Sheriff Dart and his team to better understand their challenges and concerns. We also brought together our entire membership to take a deeper look at this issue. Over the past two months, our members have been meeting almost weekly to examine potential opportunities to improve collaboration with law enforcement. I wanna take a moment to share my appreciation for the efforts of Sheriff Dart and his staff, along with you and your team, Mr. Chairman and others to elevate this important conversation. 
Clearly, the sharing of location information with anyone, including law enforcement, needs to be appropriately balanced with consumer privacy. The auto industry takes this seriously and in 2014 came together to commit to a first-of-its-kind set of privacy principles. Those principles prohibit an automaker from sharing vehicle location information with any unaffiliated third party without affirmative consent of the vehicle owner. The principles specifically permit the sharing of vehicle location information with law enforcement in the absence of affirmative consent if law enforcement has obtained a warrant or other court order to access the, local, the location information or in an exigent circumstance. This is a complex issue and one we take seriously. While the discussions with our members are ongoing, I can share a number of guiding principles as we work together on this important and complex topic. First, there is a variation in capabilities among automakers. We quickly learned this. Um, while we are not privy to each OEM's specific capabilities, we understand there is substantial variation between OEMs as well as variation in capability within some automakers. So while it's true that many modern vehicles have connectivity capability that may allow them to be located, it is not universally the case. Second, law enforcement verification. Another topic that emerged in our conversations with our members is the importance of verifying that a request for vehicle location information from law enforcement is in fact a legitimate request related to an active carjacking. Third, exigent circumstances determination. In addition to verifying that legitimate request from law enforcement, appropriate consideration must also be afforded to defining an exigent circumstance in the context of carjacking. Is it any case where a vehicle is stolen by force? Does it only apply in a circumstance where the theft places the owner or a passenger in imminent danger? At a minimum, we feel there should be a process to certify that there are exigent circumstances, which make it impossible or impractical for law enforcement to obtain either the consent of the vehicle owner or a warrant or a court order. And fourth, exposure to liability. Finally, as I'm sure members of this committee can appreciate, the sharing of real-time location information with law enforcement is a sensitive topic and may expose an automaker to liability and thus should be taken into account when evaluating different policy or technical solutions to the problem. The auto industry is committed to re remaining a constructive partner in the collective effort needed to address this challenge. Much like our work with DOT on safe systems, we look forward to continuing to examine ways in which we can support a similarly holistic approach to addressing this challenge. I wanna recognize the chairman and ranking member and members of this committee for continuing this critical conversation. Thank you, Mr. Mazzella. Mr. Glowey. Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Grassley, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the National Insurance Crime Bureau in holding this important hearing. I'm the President and Chief Executive Officer, headquartered in Des Plaines, Illinois, and ICB has been in existence since 1912. We are the nation's premier not-for-profit organization exclusively dedicated to leading a united effort to combat and prevent insurance crime through intelligence-driven operations. NICB sits at an intersection between law enforcement and the insurance industry. We are uniquely situated to serve as the information sharing hub for the government and private sector and provide operational support in identifying, preventing, and deterring in insurance-related crimes. On a daily basis, NICB approximately 400 employees work closely with domestic and international law enforcement partners, government agencies, and prosecutors throughout the country to fulfill its mission. NICB has unique expertise with auto theft investigations, particularly relating to identification and recoveries. Some of the seminal cases in which NICB provided critical assistance include the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing, the September 11th attacks, and the 2020 Nashville Christmas Day bombing. Regarding today's topic, the country is facing an unprecedented rise in vehicle thefts and carjackings. The data is explained in my written statement and highlights the disturbing trend. The states with the worst car theft trends between 2019 and 2021 include Colorado, a 79% increase, Wisconsin, a 74% increase, the state of New York, a 59% increase, and DC, a 52% increase. 
As for the carjacking numbers, they are simply staggering. Cities with the worst carjacking trends between 2019 and 2021 are the following. New York City, a 286% increase. Philadelphia, a 238% increase. Chicago, a 207% increase. DC, a 200% increase. In New Orleans, 159% increase. A disturbing subplot to these bleak numbers is that many carjackings are often committed in furtherance of other serious violent crimes. And many carjackings are committed by juveniles, some as young as 11 years old. As one admitted Chicago carjacker put it, the number one reason kids are committing carjackings is to carry out drive-by shootings. NICB partners directly with federal and local law enforcement to, to resolve these cases. For example, in April 2021, NICB assisted with the multi-regional auto theft task force in the state of New York. NICB provided the task force, force with an undercover bait car and operational funds for law enforcement equipment. Since NICB's involvement, 33 individuals have been arrested. NICB appreciates the committee's focus on these serious problems. Based on our unique position and partnership with law enforcement across the country, we believe there are several measures that can be taken at both the state and federal level. They include, first, increasing community policing programs. Reducing police presence in community, communities across the country is not the answer. Whether through the federal COPS program or other measures, we need more community policing, not less. Second, revisit well-intentioned criminal justice reform policies. The first step back of 2018, championed by Chairman Durbin and ranking member Grassley and other members of this committee, represented a monumental achievement for criminal justice reform. However, reforms in some jurisdictions may have gone too far. Criminal justice reform must be balanced with the need to protect victims of crime and the overall safety of our communities. Third, enforce the laws as written. In many jurisdictions, the law provides appropriate penalties. However, some enforcement of reform or reform policies have effectively nullified these laws, providing little deterrence for criminals to commit these serious offenses. Fourth, focus on violent offenders. It is no surprise that the most violent offenders commit the majority of serious crimes. Law enforcement should focus efforts on violent offenders through programs that prioritize enforcement efforts on the most serious offenders, such as the Project Safe Neighborhoods. Fifth, collect data on carjackings. The committee should consider directing the FBI to collect national, state, and local carjacking statistics and analyze any connections between vehicle thefts and carjackings to other violent crime. And finally, identify and implement successful early intervention programs. Given the high incidence of juvenile offenders involved in carjackings and vehicle thefts, another important tool is early intervention programs targeting at-risk use. Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Grassley, and members of the committee, thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thanks, Mr. Glowy. I'm going to start the questions. Um, I have two questions I'm going to try to get in here, but I don't know if we can do it in five minutes. The first question is privacy, Sheriff Dart, and I think that Mr. Bozzella uh, raised a good point. Uh, we all know that... Uh, there are circumstances where uh, there may be a dispute as to ownership of a car, maybe a, a testy divorce proceeding or whatever it happens to be. And the automobile, uh, automobile uh, manufacturers certainly want to cooperate with legitimate law enforcement, but don't want to get caught in a tangle, it leaves them open to liability. That's my first question. And I'll come to you in just a minute to start the answer. The second question, Mr. Glowy, I asked the CEO of Walgreens, why is underarm deodorant under lock and key in your stores of all the things you sell? And he said, because there's a secondary market for retail theft. And that underarm deodorant is going to end up in a flea market or online, along with a lot of other things. And so we're trying to stop the theft at the source, with the smash and grab and the like. Has there been something in the world of automobiles and uh, that has created a secondary market or some part of this that uh, you'll, you might address after Sheriff Dart uh, speaks to privacy. Thank you so much, Senator. Uh, I've heard the privacy uh, issue brought up, and it's real to a certain extent, but for starters, the victims are there with us, and they've given consent, and they want this done. A, if there are bad actors, if there are bad actors who are using this for the wrong purpose, there are plenty of ways, uh, as a former prosecutor, that you can charge these people for that. Um, so I, I do not think that's the reason we should be paralyzed here, because I was out with our people on a carjacking mission uh, last week, 
And I cannot tell you the difference. It was such a great idea of how this could work. We had one car that we were tracking. We had active tracking going on. Our biggest question was what one of our cars was gonna pull him over and arrest him. He was a person with a parole warrant and he had, uh, was in for shooting at police officers. We, we got him in custody, no issues. In another car that we were working with, we were in the backseat of the car with um, license plate readers looking for cars that are on our list because there's warrants for them, they've been stolen, carjacking, so on. By the time the license plate reader hits though, it's four seconds before we get it. They're on the expressway in the Dan Ryan. They're now five miles down. Just we're completely operating in the dark. When it's tracked, we're there right on top of it. When it's not tracked, it's completely, completely random, and we occasionally will get lucky. And so that's why this privacy issue, it's real, but it absolutely cannot be stopping this and slowing this thing down because we need this right now. I mean, this could be the game changer. The other things can be impactful a little bit. The tracking's everything. Mr. Bozzella, you want to say a word before I turn to Mr. Glowy? I, I would simply say that um, we're, we're looking to work with law enforcement to find a way to get this balance right. And we think we're making progress in that regard. Um, and we think that we can do this in a way that balances consumer privacy uh, with the consumer's need uh, to be protected from carjacking. Maybe the industry could start by having a consistent uh, piece of technology uh, as opposed to many different ones, as you mentioned. Mr. Glowy, would you like to comment on the secondary market issue? Sure. Chairman Durbin, thank you for the question. Um, we have long-standing relationships with the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Department of Homeland Security, and Customs and Border Protection, specifically, and state and local law enforcement in all 50 states and U.S. territories. Um, this topic is very near, very near and dear to NICB. We have done car investigations for over 100 years. So regarding secondary markets, the carjackings are usually associated in a conspiracy of other violations, criminal drive-by shootings and other offenses. But the secondary market for auto thefts or cars that are stolen is also different. We've seen a 39% increase in used vehicles over the last two years, approximately. There's a high supply, a high demand and a low supply. Cars are being stolen here in the United States. There's VIN swaps that are utilized to, to resell the vehicles so they're not known that they are stolen. They're shipped overseas, Middle East criminal enterprises. They go outbound, many of you are aware. They were funding for terrorism investigations, especially Lebanese Hezbollah in my prior capacity as uh, department head uh, for intelligence for DHS. We've talked about that in our past. And then cars are also shipped to Mexico. We, we repatriate hundreds of cars a year that are shipped into Mexico after they're stolen. So, Senator, there is an extensive organized crime, criminal conspiracy throughout the United States and worldwide uh, on the supply chain on stolen vehicles. And we could even get into catalytic converters. So there is a lot of profit to be made right now in this industry for the crime and for the criminals. Senator Grassley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to all of you for your testimony. I'm going to start with Mr. Herdman. Uh, you heard my opening remarks about carjackings up nationwide at alarming rates. Federal prosecutors have a role to play in bringing federal carjacking uh, charges. Uh, I want to I help federal prosecutors get the tools they need to keep our communities safe. So do you do carjackings regularly involve gangs and other criminal conspiracies? And secondly and lastly, what has been the federal role in taking down gangs through carjacking and related prosecutions. Thank you, Senator Grassley. Yes, I would say, just to echo what the other panelists have, have added, uh, carjacking is absolutely uh, in the toolbox of really any street gang that's operating in major American cities at this point in time. Um, they tend to, uh, gangs in general will tend to engage in obviously shootings uh, and other intimidation tactics. Um, but robberies, aggravated robberies, and particularly car thefts are important because they do help to facilitate other crimes, um, uh, which has been addressed by other panelists as well. So when you're looking at a criminal street gang uh, or any other kind of violent criminal organization, it's important to identify the predicate offenses that those gangs are committing because then that allows federal prosecutors and federal investigators to build a RICO investigation or its corollary a Vicar investigation uh, into a violent street gang organization. Uh, and carjacking obviously is playing an increasing role in the operations of those gangs and those violent organizations and will form the basis for larger network type prosecutions that can take down not just one or two offenders, but an entire gang all at once. Uh, for Mr. Glaway, uh, 
when a vehicle is carjacked, both law enforcement and the car's owners want to find it before it can be used for another crime or uh, attacker uh, can get away. Uh, so for you, in what ways does private industry currently cooperate with law enforcement, and are there roadblocks to this cooperation? Senator, thank you for the question. Uh, NICB has been partnering and sharing information with federal, state, and local law enforcement for 100 years, and specifically regarding car thefts and carjackings. Um, we are the information sharing hub, intelligence driven operations, bridging the gap between the private sector, the insurance industry, and those law enforcement partners. Uh, we are generally protected by statute in that very narrow scope of sharing information, criminal information, uh, in most states. Any barrier or impediment to that would negatively affect the crime citing mission and the public. Uh, let me uh, lead into a question for Mr. Herbin Garcia to respond to. Under Operation Legend, the Department of Justice sent more officers to cities to help fight violent crime. Increasing officers and uh, patrols uh, seem to work very well. When the rise in anti-crime rhetoric and defund the police efforts, law enforcement across the country have struggled to retain enough officers to do proactive policing and to go out on standard police patrols. Additionally, the Biden administration hasn't continued the initiatives like Operation Legend, uh, even while police departments are short-staffed. Chief Garcia, uh, can you explain to the committee uh, how having officers physically present and on patrols in certain areas are an integral part of reducing crime in these communities. And for Mr. Herdman, how important were federal resources and the increased presence of law enforcement to the success in your city in fighting violent crime? Thank you, Senator, for the question. Um, as I had mentioned in my comments, uh, proactive policing is integral uh, to reduction of violent crime. Uh, having a plan, being scoped, and putting officers in the right locations, uh, being vigilant, uh, addressing problem areas, individuals uh, that are recidivists, uh, drug houses, uh, things of the sort, uh, and being there in the area, uh, reduce violent crime. Uh, we have shown it to reduce violent crime. In addition to that, many things, as we've talked about, I know the concept of ghost guns comes around. Uh, well, I'm here to say, and I that you know, you don't just find ghost guns thrown around uh, at the scene of crimes. The way ghost guns usually from uh, patrol officers or SWAT officers or operational perspectives get found, it's by a hardworking man or woman making an investigative car stop or an individual getting a search warrant on a home and then coming up with what that is. I'll tell you, um, in the city of Dallas, uh, we would not have these reductions if not for the proactive investigative work of the men and women of the Dallas Police Department. And the perspectives are that I can't force a man or woman at three o'clock in the morning to make an investigative car stop in one of our most violent crime grids in the city and arrest a uh, armed drug dealing felon. Uh, they do that because they will feel supported. Uh, they do that because procedural justice has to work internal inside the organization in order for it to exist outside the organization. And if officers don't feel that they're being treated fairly, if officers don't feel supported, they'll disengage from our communities when we need them to engage more now than ever. And not just from a proactive policing perspective, but from a community outreach perspective. And both those concepts aren't mutually exclusive. But again, uh, proactive policing and having officers in the right areas, uh, no plan will work uh, if you don't have that. Mr. Herdman, would you give a short answer to my question, please, so we can move on? Yes, thank you, Senator Grassley, and I will keep it short. Operation Legend, obviously I, I was very fortunate to be able to extend that to Cleveland. Um, the, the, the beauty of it was that, as the chief was saying, when you had a patrol officer who made an arrest or made a stop, there was immediate reach back to federal resources because uh, we had ATF agents, FBI agents, DEA agents, and the marshals working arm and glove, or hand in glove, arm in arm with police officers. They were based out of our districts in Cleveland, Ohio, and we had resources that were provided, including a coordination van that the ATF had so that we could make correlations on ballistic evidence. The second thing was that um, we had committed federal prosecutors to bring these cases federally. 
Um, so we could target and identify the most uh, violent offenders uh, and ensure that they were held in, uh, confined, and taken off the streets and prosecuted federally immediately. And then the third thing, obviously, there was a funding component. Uh, and that was very important both for morale, but I think also for long-term growth and coordination with federal agencies. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Klobuchar. Thank you very much, Senator Durbin, uh, Senator Grassley, for holding this important hearing. When I was a DA in Hennepin County, our biggest county, uh, when I first got there, we had rampant carjacking. Uh, we made major focus on this. Back then, it was bait cars. It was more, of course, uh, cars being stolen um, from the street, but oftentimes there are also people in them, and I'm committed uh, to making a change here. I thought it was interesting what you talked about, uh, Mr. Glaw, which makes some sense to me about everything you guys said made sense, but I want to start with this, with the, with the uh, organized crime and this idea that some of this is just you know, people doing this for the fun of it, um, uh, with people dead as a result. But some of it is uh, because of the high demand for vehicles, and they're taking these cars. And would that make you lead more to a uh, federal response and the need for coordination with the FBI, U.S. Attorney's Office, and such? Senator, thank you for the question. And um, fortunately, NICB is postured. That's what we do. And uh, we actually have two former U.S. attorneys that are on my staff here today with us. Um, we have aggressively postured with the FBI, Homeland Security Investigations, uh, and state and local law enforcement, exactly what you're talking about. The demand for cars right now is at an all-time high in the United States, up 39%. You can barely get a car when you go into a lot. And it has created a market for criminal organizations, especially if they don't actually commit a robbery, a violent crime. These are property crimes. And uh, we have seen a tremendous uptick in the United States since 2019, a 16% increase in auto theft, but just the numbers on auto theft, Colorado's seen a 79% increase in auto theft, Wisconsin, 74, Vermont, 64, New York, 59%, DC, yep, 50. Yep, I know. Yeah. Could I give you yep. my, my numbers? Sure. Uh, Minneapolis alone, this is one city, yeah. saw a 537% increase in carjackings between 2019 and 2020. Uh, in 2021, uh, there were more than 640 successful or attempted carjackings in one city. Uh, that is not so different than what you're seeing by the numbers in Cook County, uh, Sheriff. Um, I, I, it's very similar with the percentages uh, where you've seen carjacking spike uh, nearly threefold. Um, I, I want to go to a different topic here uh, with you, Chief Garcia, and that would be about, in general, supporting the police and the need to uh, with the morale issue and the like. I've led bipartisan legislation for years with Senator Murkowski, Coons, Tillis, uh, about reauthorizing the COPS program. Um, could you talk about how that helps local law enforcement? Absolutely. Having that support from, with the, from the COPS office and the COPS program, not only for the programs that we want to do and institute with regards to uh, looking at ways uh, if we remember the old uh, weed and seed programs that we would have uh, prior. Uh, you know, I was a big weed and seed uh, back in the early 90s when I started this uh, and we kind of had a resurgence of it in the city of Dallas with, uh, with the terminology and using that. Uh, but having those resources, helping resources and getting officers on the street, doing both proactive policing as well as community engagement is crucial and critical. Uh, more police officers in law enforcement agencies, if you have a plan, reduces violent crime. If you have a plan. Yes, yes. ma'am. Uh, I agree. Um, um, Mr. Herdman, um, in early February, the U.S. Attorney's Office in Minnesota brought federal charges against a group of um, seven men for violent crimes, including carjacking. Uh, these cases were being prosecuted as part of the joint federal, state, and local Project Safe Neighborhoods, uh, which is, as you know, a federal um, initiative led by U.S. attorneys. Uh, how does partnering with local and state law enforcement agencies act as a force multiplier for the U.S. Attorney's offices? Thank you for the question, Senator Klobuchar. The, um, the federal agencies, um, I, they operate most effectively, in my experience, when they actually are present in, in the police departments. When, when you have ATF agents and FBI agents who show up and work hand-in-hand -hand on the same shifts with patrol officers, I think that that's a very effective way to demonstrate a message not only to the police officers in the in the big city department, but I think also to the community. Um, and so I would suspect that that's what was going on um, with, with the Violent Crime Task Force in Minneapolis, I would hope so, um, because you do see it's, it's daily coordination and hourly coordination as opposed to on a quarterly basis or a biannual basis. It's much more frequent and I think much more effective that way. 
So you would agree that it's important to have a U.S. attorney uh, in place, um, regardless of their political party, have someone in place running these offices? I, I'm aware of the candidate who's been nominated. He's my partner at Jones Day, Mr. Luger. <laughs> Are and you kidding? I didn't know that. And, <laughs> and uh, I, I will say um, I'm on the record, I think, uh, with respect to Mr. Luger, he's superbly qualified. Thank you. And as uh, you should all know that uh, Mr. Luger was the U.S. attorney at the end of President Obama's term, actually um, President the Justice Department under Donald Trump. He was one of two people they were considering having stayed on. He uh, decided to go another route, and now he's ready to come back. He has strong support uh, from Republican leaders that people on this side of the dais know. We haven't had problems with Andy Luger uh, from most of the Republican senators. Uh, this is a crusade of Tom Cotton's, uh, who is not just holding up Mr. Luger, he's holding up uh, a number of other U.S. attorneys and marshals. And I've got a situation in my state and he's not here right now, where we have two retired police chiefs in Minneapolis-St. Paul. Uh, like many jurisdictions, uh, we don't have enough police right now. And Andy Luger has vast experience and is willing to take on this carjacking issue. But Tom Cotton has decided, because of his uh, opposition to something happening in another state, that he is holding up my U.S. attorney. And I have had it. And if he wants to be on the side of carjackers, go ahead. But we need leadership. This is not just a state and local issue. This is an organized crime issue, as Mr. Glaw has pointed out. Uh, this is an issue that goes beyond little local jurisdictions and one neighborhood's cop. Uh, it is about the cops doing their jobs, but it is also about taking on these cases in a big, big way. Um, None of you have much to do with this. I cannot believe you're at the same law firm, Mr. Herdman. I did not know that. Um, but I uh, would really appreciate my colleagues on the other side of the aisle uh, talking to Mr. Cotton to find some way to resolve this in the next week, because I am not going to give this up. You cannot hold up the U.S. attorneys who have no serious objections, the support from Republicans, just to make a case, because you want them to get attention nationally. Thank you. I might add that the U.S. Marshal for the Northern District of Illinois is also on Senator Cotton's list. Senator the Marshal in the state of Minnesota. Senator Cornyn. Chief Garcia, you can understand why I and others uh, from Texas and uh, particularly in the Dallas area are, are proud of the great work that you and the uh, Dallas Police Department have done and the support that you've gotten from uh, leadership like Mayor Johnson and the City Council, and I appreciate your being here and uh, sharing your uh, formula for success. Is there any reason why other cities across the country couldn't embrace uh, your approach in Dallas with similar results? Uh, there is no reason, Senator. Uh, I, I believe some have reached out, uh, some have reached out to us, uh, and some have reached out to my criminologist partners as well, uh, but there is no reason why other agencies can't be doing the same things. I'm, am I correct in assuming that uh, since uh, carjacking involves the threat or actual uh, use of violence uh, that overwhelmingly it involves a, a firearm? Overwhelmingly, yes. And you, uh, Chief, and I think Mr. Glau, if I pronounce his name correctly, uh, both mentioned Project Safe Neighborhood, and which of course is a federal program designed to uh, go after uh, uh, violent offenders that use a firearm, uh, felons in possession and others and use the mandatory minimums available under federal uh, firearms law. Um, that started out, as I recall, as Project Exile in uh, the Richmond uh, U.S. Attorney's Office years ago in Texas when I was Attorney General. We, we, uh, we called it Texas Exile, but the basic point is working with uh, local and state law enforcement and uh, federal resources, particularly the federal prosecutors, to use federal law to uh, go after violent uh, gun offenders and uh, use the mandatory minimum um, uh, available under federal law in order to dissuade people from using a firearm in the first place, and if you couldn't, to put them behind bars for a significant pe uh, period of time. In your experience, Chief, is uh, Project Safe Neighborhood a, a, an important component of your ability to uh, lower violent crime and reduce gun crime in, in Dallas? Absolutely. We have a remarkable relationship uh, with my FBI, DEA, ATF, Marshall's office. Uh, we are in constant conversations. They have molded what we're doing to PSN to look at how we're doing our crime plan and be able to make that coexist. Uh, there is no question that the deterrent 
of filing these cases federally does work. Uh, and again, as we made mention earlier, I mean, one of the things we need to do is really utilize the laws that we have on the books. If we believe that gun crime is an issue, then individuals that are violating those laws need to be held accountable to the highest extent. Uh, Mr. Glau, you uh, also mentioned Project Safe Neighborhoods. Do you share the chief's uh, point of view on that? Senator, I do. Chief Garcia is exactly correct. I was actually an agent in Richmond almost 20 years ago on that program you're talking about. Very familiar with it. Um, absolutely. It's a holistic approach, a strategy which needs a deterrent effect and, and, and strong enforcement and support of law enforcement, but also the community engagement and looking to off-ramp out at-risk use in the community before they commit the crimes. But I absolutely agree, agree with the chief. And Mr. Herdman, you used to be a U.S. attorney. Uh, what's your view? Yeah, yes, uh, Senator Corner, thank you for the question. Um, absolutely, there needs to be um, a, a thought out, uh, and I think the chief has put this very well, um, a plan, a plan that can be executed on uh, and followed up. So there's close coordination between federal agencies and local law enforcement, again, on identifying the most violent, uh, most persistent felons uh, and ensuring that they uh, receive uh, federal prosecutions if they're found to be in illegal possession of a firearm. It's absolutely effective. Chief Garcia, I, I believe you and the uh, district attorney uh, uh, in Dallas County have a good working relationship, um, but how important is it to have supportive prosecutors? Um, obviously, they, uh, the police can't prosecute the crime. You investigate the crime and you uh, apprehend people who violate the law, but then it's up to the prosecutor to bring the charges. Um, it's uh, no secret that around the country that there have been a group of prosecutors that have, have declined to enforce laws that are on the books and um, with disastrous consequences for public safety. But can you just speak to the importance of having uh, good, solid prosecutors who will enforce the laws written? Uh, it's incredibly important. Uh, absolutely important to hold individuals accountable, uh, particularly individuals that have committed violence. Uh, the, recidiv the recidivism that we see when individuals uh, are re-released quickly is an issue. Uh, but in addition to the district attorneys, uh, you know, that we need to also call into question judges mm -hmm. as well that are making decisions. Uh, particularly the district attorney in Dallas County has very little to say when it has to do with bonds or bail. Uh, that's on judges. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, you know, there are judges that have made uh, irresponsible decisions uh, in letting individuals uh, out uh, after they've committed uh, acts of violence uh, that have come back to hurt our communities. But what I would finish with this, the message, uh, we have to control what we can control. And the message that I give my men and women is if another part of the system lets us down and you have to respond back to that house 20 times, then you respond back to that house 20 times because we're not going to let our community down. Thank you. Senator Coons. Thank you, Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Grassley, for holding this important hearing on uh, carjackings, a form of violent crime that is steadily increasing across both red and blue states. It's the latest in a series of hearings uh, you've held in this committee to look at violence prevention and what we can do uh, to be smarter on crime and more effective. And what's the federal role to help reverse this alarming trend? Um, as the co-chair of the Senate Law Enforcement Caucus with Senator Blunt of Missouri, I'm particularly sensitive to the challenges of law enforcement um, where there's inadequate or uneven collection of data. And one of the challenges here in terms of understanding the rise in carjackings across the country, and particularly in my home state of Delaware, is accurate and comprehensive statewide statistics, partly in my state because of um, how criminal law categorizes crime, uh, depending on the particular facts of each case. So if I could, uh, first Sheriff Dart and uh, Chief Garcia, um, I'd be interested in hearing about <clears throat> some of the obstacles uh, to state and local data collection on carjackings. And then I'd be very interested in hearing how you think federal law enforcement can most critically play a constructive role in addressing this ongoing challenge. Sheriff? Thank you so much, Senator. Um, you, you nailed it, Senator. When we first got engaged with this because of the rise, our very first stumbling block was getting beyond the anecdotes and to actually have real hard data. And we spent an inordinate amount of time in our office collecting all the data from the city of Chicago and all the rest of the suburbs to put a comprehensive database together. And why was that important? Well, just to get at where were the carjackings occurring? What time of day? What vehicles were they using? Everything was all across the board. And I, I can't emphasize enough how correct you are. So we have 130 suburbs in my county as well. 
And it runs the gamut from ones that are wildly well-funded to ones that literally, literally pay their officers $10 an hour. And so the turnover is such that more often than not, I'm called in to do their patrol work because they don't have anybody for shift after shift. So with that, when you ask about what can the federal government do, anything and everything you, you can do to put together a template on data collection, to put together resources so that it isn't just the well-off departments have dashboards like we do. We have a phenomenal dashboard that we put together, but they have the ability to do it because everyone knows if you put junk in, that's what you're going to get. Thank and you, sure. when, when I was county executive in Delaware, one of the things we did was literally borrow from Cook County's uh, work on a data analysis. Forgive me, I just have two and a half minutes. Chief, Please. if you could, how can law enforcement federally best help law enforcement at the municipal and local level? You know, I will say this. if uh, The model that we have really is truly having SACs that are in place that truly want to buy in to the law enforcement agency's mission and role. And to not be, and not be single-minded, but be able to, to not just you know, look outside the box, but act outside the box with regards to who their law enforcement partner is yep. and having those relationships. Having ATF, DEA, FBI, marshals actively engaged, coordinating with local law enforcement, and then using that data analysis to target those resources, that strikes me as one of the things we can bring to the table. Last two questions, if I might, Mr. Herdman. Um, you mentioned in your testimony, expanded federal prosecution of juveniles involved in carjackings isn't a reasonable solution. Could you tell us briefly why not? Thank you, Senator, uh, and appreciate the question. Yes, it's, um, it's just not feasible. Uh, the volume of offender, uh, as well as um, the, uh, the, the uh, resources that are available on the federal level and the federal courts are just not feasible for widespread prosecution of juveniles. And I think we have, to, we have to acknowledge that going in because of the prevalence of juvenile offenders, particularly in carjacking, um, and identify other ways that there could be federal support for prosecution, rehabilitation, and reentry for youthful offenders. Well, the president's made a proposal to fund community violence interventions as a means of reducing violent crime. Mr. Bryant, what sort of community-based interventions could make a meaningful impact in reducing the involvement of juveniles, of kids, in this particular kind of violent crime? Thank you for the question. Um, I think really reaching out to the highest risk individuals, uh, typically those are actually going to be adults. And the more that we can rehabilitate adults, the better they're going to be as parents for their kids because we have to, you know, sort of rehabilitate our communities, our families, so that they're more self-sustaining, uh, so that the institutions that are going to educate our kids and heal our kids are all working in tandem. So the work we do is really trying to build at the community level because it's the people in the community that have to be empowered to, to do for themselves. Thank you, Mr. Bryant. I think I can see a general approach, improve data collection and analysis, improve the coordination, having senior agents in charge, special agents in charge who actually bring federal resources to bear, um, make sure that we're not targeting juveniles in a way that um, makes them essentially the scapegoat for what is a broader challenge, um, and have community-based interventions. We have to have effective and appropriate law enforcement and prosecutions targeted to the most violent adult individuals and community-based supports for those um, undergoing reentry to make sure they don't reoffend and to give them the support and the options um, to avoid a steady increase in this kind of crime. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this productive hearing. Thanks, Senator Coons. Senator Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to each of you for being here. Mr. Glau, I want to come to you first. Uh, Senator Coons was just talking about targeting the right, uh, the right, putting the focus where it should be. Now, in Tennessee, we make automobiles. And there are some that want to sue the automakers because they say automakers should be able to make it harder to hijack a car. And to me, this sounds a lot like victim blaming. But I'd like for you just to touch on uh, what the effect of some of these proposed lawsuits against automakers and then how that would affect the cost to manufacturers, how it may set up uh, perverse incentives. Senator, thank you for the question. From NICB's perspective, we are the hub for information sharing. We have a manufacturer's working group. We work with the insurance industry and federal, state, and local law enforcement for 100 years. This is what we do. So any impediment for sharing of intelligence or information on stolen vehicles, cars have been stolen, or any crimes would, would hurt our mission and hurt the public. 
So I would say uh, when, when thoughtful legislation is occurring at the federal or state level, information sharing narrowly scope for crime information is critical to our mission space and to break down those barriers. I appreciate that. And, you know, I was struck um, by the, the DOJ focus that we have had in their violence reduction strategy on what they call the iron pipeline and uh, gun dealers. And I think this response really misses the mark if we're talking about targeting and we're talking about focusing. And one of the things that we have seen as we've looked at this issue is the way police departments and law enforcement agencies are drained of resources right now and the way some of these local entities are on this defund the police push. So uh, the other thing that has interested me is the way progressive prosecutors have really uh, come to be in major metropolitan cities and how they're refusing to prosecute some of these criminals. So Chief Garcia, um, talk a minute about where you are, and then Mr. Herdman, I want to come to you. Let's talk about gun reform, and if that's the appropriate path, or is it better to go in and look at uh, the issue of the violent offenders, look at the necessity for law lawful gun ownership, and the effects that some of these policies have? Uh, thank you, Senator. What I will say, first of all, that to me, it is the access of firearms to criminals uh, that are not being held accountable. Uh, that is my issue. If we're going to strengthen the law, the laws we have on the books, then let's strengthen it so that we have responsible gun ownership, uh, that we have uh, safe stored guns. Uh, but ultimately, again, it's the criminal access to firearms that's the issue. Okay, Mr. Herdman. I couldn't agree more, Senator. Uh, we, we, uh, we took a very offender-based uh, approach in the Justice Department when I was U.S. Attorney, and I think that that's the appropriate way to, to approach this problem. Um, you have individuals who are not only in possession illegally of a firearm, but they've demonstrated uh, through their history and uh, through their prior conduct that they're willing to engage in violent activity against uh, their, their fellow residents of their city. So I think, I, I think the offender-based approach is the only one that really works um, because those are the people that we have to be concerned about, the ones who are willing not only to, to possess a firearm illegally but to use it. And you have to, you have, to have a strategy that's going to address that well, threat. I think you're right about that. And then you look at some of these liberal prosecutors, and I hear from a lot of women who are very concerned about people like Chesa Bowden and Gascon and the fact that you have these violent offenders that end up back on the streets. And uh, they're concerned about the Biden administration doubling down on a soft on crime strategy and what they see coming from people like Rachel Rollins, who declined to prosecute 15 different crimes as a matter of policy. A, and as a US attorney from Massachusetts, and just last week, we had a nominee for the Eastern District of New York who has publicly applauded the progressive prosecutor movement. And that's unfortunate for the people of New York because that individual may end up on the federal bench. So Mr. Herdman, uh, what kind of internal reform do we need to see as for our district attorneys and US attorneys across the country so that they are addressing this rise in violent crime? I've been a lawyer for over 20 years, Senator, and uh, most of that has been spent as a prosecutor, either a state or federal prosecutor. Uh, and the one thing that I, I thought was the most important part of my job was not to act as a legislator when I was in that role. Um, I was very aware of the fact that I was part of the executive branch. It was my job to carry out the law that was given to us by the legislature and that had been approved by the courts. Um, that was the attitude that I had when I was U.S. attorney. That was the approach that we took when we prosecuted cases out of the Northern District of Ohio when I was U.S. Attorney. And I think that's the most fundamental obligation you have as a prosecutor, is to prosecute the law that's given to you, not to try to legislate from your office. And that is important for us to keep in mind as we look at judges and as we look at uh, U.S. Attorney nominees. It's important to stay in your lane. Thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Senator Tillis. You want to defer to him? Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Over the last several years, we have seen countless Democrats across the country embracing the movement to defund or abolish the police. We've seen Democrats supporting district attorneys funded in significant part by George Soros, who refuse to prosecute violent crime, who release violent criminals into our community. And the consequence of these extreme policies is sadly predictable. When they began demonizing cops, when they began advocating for de defunding and abolishing the police, all of us who had worked in law enforcement said the result is going to be skyrocketing crime. And tragically, that is precisely the result we've seen. Nationwide, homicides increased 30% from 2019 to 2020. 27 major U.S. cities experienced a 44% increase in homicides since 2019. Homicides increased in 44 of the seven major cities from 2020 to 2021, and over a dozen cities set new homicide records in 2021. The topic of this hearing, carjacking, has been particularly horrific. New York City carjackings quadrupled since 2018 to more than 500 in 2021. Philadelphia quadrupled since 2015 to more than 800 in 2021. New Orleans nearly tripled from 2018 to 2021. Washington, D.C., they're up 300% since 2019. Minneapolis, they're up 375% from 2020 to 2021. And Chicago carjackings have been increased an astonishing 500% since 2014 after carjackings skyrocketed in 2020. All of these are, are endangering people's lives. They're endangering their family. They're endangering their children. Chief Garcia, Mayor of Dallas, Eric Johnson, has become a friend. And I will say you and the mayor have shown remarkable courage, bucking a national trend and taking on some of the extreme voices on the left, advocating abolishing the police, advocating defunding the police, advocating slashing funding for the police. And instead, the mayor, with you working along his side, have courageously argued the best way to protect communities, particularly low-income communities, is having an effective police force that is well-resourced, that is on the ground to protect people's lives. And as a consequence, Dallas was the only one of the top 10 cities in this country where violent crime fell in 2021. Chief Garcia... How harmful do you believe efforts to defund or abolish the police have been? And what's the best way to stop violent crime? Well, first I'll say that I think the, there's just been a false narrative. And it's those in power believing the rhetoric that has been the issue. I'm not a stay in the office kind of chief senator, um, whether it was in my former position as chief in California or chief now in the city of Dallas. I have not met a neighborhood impacted by violent crime in the city of Dallas, Texas, regardless of language spoken, racial makeup, or economic status, that has ever asked me for less police. In fact, unfortunately, it's our communities of color that usually plead for me for more. Yes, they want fair policing. Yes, we want to be just. Yes, we need to get better. But none of the neighborhoods that I go see want us to go away. And so there is, a, there is definitely a, uh, a disconnect between what we're hearing, the false narrative, and what's actually occurring in neighborhoods that are impacted by violent crime. The second part to your question is, we need to ensure that the morale of the department is high. We need to ensure that communities know that we're there to support them. And then we need to make sure that we team up with scientists, doctors of criminology to tell us what the best practices are so that we have credibility, not only to our community, that what we're doing is not just something else that we're throwing up against the wall, but to our rank and file so they don't feel the same way as well. Because, again, without the buy-in from both, no plan's going to be successful. Th thank you, Chief. You know, I will say it's not just a few radical voices on the far left, but sadly the Biden administration, President Biden, 
has nominated two of the leading advocates for abolishing the police to senior positions in the Department of Justice, and astonishingly, every single Senate Democrat voted to confirm them. President Biden has nominated prosecutors who have been Soros prosecutors releasing violent criminals. He's nominated them to senior positions, and sadly, every single Democrat has voted to confirm them. Sheriff Dart, let me ask you a final question. In January of this year, you spoke to the New York Post about the pretrial monitoring program that you operate on behalf of Cook County. Uh, and you voiced concerns over the type of defendants that were placed in pretrial home confinement. You stated that you have 2,600 defendants on pretrial home monitoring, and 75 to 80 percent of those defendants sent to home monitoring, not sent uh, to jail, are charged with a violent offense. What are the consequences of 75 to 80 percent of the defendants with, with on home monitoring being charged with a violent offense? And are the district attorneys objecting and fighting? My, I understand the judges are sending them there, but what's, what's the DA's office view on this? Well, it, it, to your point, Senator, um, you're right. I mean, to the police officers out on the street, it's beyond demoralizing because so many of these are the folks that take us so much time to get the initial case against them. And then literally when they're back out on the street an hour later uh, on home monitoring, it's, it's very demoralizing. And so it's something that um, is frankly, and it's been brought up here numerous times already, uh, in, on the judicial side, it has been very, very difficult. I'm a former prosecutor myself, and you could talk all you want when you're in court on the bond uh, side of it, but it's the judge who will make that ultimate determination. And I made it clear to them for home monitoring purposes, that's not what it was ever set up for. It was set up for drug offenders and people on those lines. And so when you put those folks out, not only is it very difficult for us to monitor them, because that's not what it was set up for, but it's very demoralizing for the communities, because they know full well that that guy was, a, was bad. He finally got caught, but now he's right back. And so it's been very, very difficult and very trying. Thank you. We often hear claims about defunding the police, and I'd like to enter into the record uh, some uh, information about significant increases in federal funding for state and local law enforcement under the Biden administration. The American Rescue Plan passed with only Democratic votes in the Senate provided $350 billion in state and local funding that the Biden administration has made available for use in hiring law enforcement personnel, purchasing law enforcement technology and equipment, and supporting community violence intervention programs. Uh, I'm not going to read the entire statement for the record, but I will add that the only instance where we have a senator holding up the appointment of law enforcement officials at the federal level to help deal with the crime we're talking about today is a Republican senator from Arkansas. Uh, he can't explain it because there's no complaint about any of these individuals. He just has his own feelings toward the subject. But to argue that this is a partisan subject is an oversimplification. Senator Blumenthal. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all for being here. I was a former federal prosecutor, the U.S. Attorney in Connecticut, and state attorney general in Connecticut for 20 years, and I know firsthand how challenging and sometimes heartbreaking your job is, and I admire your dedication as career law enforcement officials to this cause. I want to emphasize uh, a point here that I think the American people really feel very deeply, which is this cause should not be partisan. We shouldn't be fighting among ourselves, Republicans against Democrats on law enforcement. It ought to be absolutely across the aisle, 100% in your favor. And these numbers, $350 billion in state and local funding in the American Rescue Plan, $2.1 billion for state and local law enforcement assistance, $184 million above the FY21 number. We ought to be increasing the resources available, not just in the hardware, the equipment, but also in the kind of training and, yes, counseling that you need, that many of the folks who go through trauma, they experience trauma firsthand, and it impacts them. They deserve it, and they need it. So more funding 
is part of the answer here. And the more we are fighting and trying to discredit colleagues on this issue or at the community level, fellow elected officials, uh, fellow citizens, the more we are drawn into a morass of inaction. And that's a disservice to you, but more fundamentally to our crime victims and survivors who need that help. And as, as you said, Chief, uh, I have never found a community where people say, oh, uh, give us less protection. We need fewer cops on the beat. We need less safeguards against the drive-by shootings that take our young people when they're sitting on porches in downtown Hartford or just otherwise going about their lives. Americans feel deeply about this issue and they want support for our law enforcement and we should be giving them more, not just in dollars, but emotional support as well. This issue of carjacking uh, has bedeviled me since I was US attorney and tried to get the FBI to investigate carjacking. Federal law prohibits it, but as you know, uh, it requires proof beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant had intent to cause serious bodily harm or death. And some courts have required evidence to establish such intent, quote, at the precise moment, end quote, the car is taken. Let me ask you, to make this law more effective and crimes more easily provable when they involve carjacking, should we make it presumptive evidence that someone had a firearm at the time they took a car, that they meant bodily harm if they have a firearm, whether or not they're a convicted felon and they could legally possess it, and even whether it's properly licensed to them. You have a firearm at the time you carjack a car, there's federal jurisdiction. Let me turn that question over to you. If I may, Senator. Um, I appreciate the question, and I, and I think the, the inclusion of that particular specific intent mens rea in the statute is a hindrance uh, to being able to bring federal cases. Um, and, I, and I do think, obviously, in other places we have uh, firearm enhancements or firearm uh, as the basis for jurisdiction for a federal offense. Here we also separately have a vehicle that's in interstate commerce. Um, but I, I do agree that it's unusual to see that kind of a mens rea in a violent crime statute. Uh, and it, it does serve as at least initially an obstacle to bringing these cases. I, I spoke in my opening testimony about the risk associated with carjacking. It happens in a split second. There's a moving car involved. Sometimes there's passengers in the car who are not seen to the perpetrator, including children. Um, that raises the risk that there's going to be some sort of resistance, uh, either by virtue of surprise or by virtue of trying to defend uh, family members from the person who's a victim of the crime. The inclusion of a firearm in that set of circumstances greatly increases the risk of somebody being seriously injured or killed in the course of a carjacking. And we see that over and over and over again. Um, so I do think um, for the committee's work, if there were some consideration, uh, both of the mens rea component of this, as well as addition of a conspiracy statute within 2119 itself, um, that would be um, very effective for federal prosecutors and would greatly assist the ability to bring these cases federally. And Senator, if I can just add as well, uh, I work very closely with our U.S. attorney in Chicago, and he's phenomenal, but he's brought up the exact point that was just made, that he cannot proceed because of what you had pointed out. And these crimes, not only are they very violent, they're very organized. And so they usually have multiple cars, so the person holding the gun on the individual is not the one that gets in the car, somebody else gets in the car, they have a, follow, a trail car that goes usually a couple blocks away, they flip drivers, and so it's very complex, conspiracy, absolutely. But to the other point we talked about, that's why the tracking is so imperative. Because if we don't get that car quickly, there is no scenario where that poor victim who just had a gun put to their head is going to be able to identify anybody. What we'll have is a, a, a fourth individual is actually the one in the car that we caught, not the one that started it. So that's why these type of uh, discussions would be so helpful to us because th this is very well organized and these are crews that are doing it in a very thoughtful fashion. 
fashion. Um, you know, I think your points are very well taken and we're sort of talking lawyer talk here. We know that mens rea is an element of a crime that has to be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. Walking into court as a prosecutor, you got a checklist, elements of the crime, got to prove intent. But to do bodily harm at the time of the, the crime, at that precise moment, is hard to prove unless you have some physical evidence like possession of a firearm. And it can be, if you're proving a conspiracy, it can be one of the conspirators. And as you well put it here this morning, uh, these crimes succeed because they are organized. They are, in effect, a conspiracy. So uh, thanks for your observations. Uh, Sheriff, thank you, and uh, thank you very much for um, all of you for being here today. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Boomthal. Senator Tillis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Chief Garcia, how's morale? I would say morale, indicative of the amazing work the men and women are doing, is in a direction that we want it to go, because we couldn't be doing what we're doing if it wasn't. How are retirements uh, on the one end versus recruiting on the other end? You know, our... You know, what we're looking at is uh, retirements are coming off a as usual uh, for every every year. We're looking at about 200, 195 to 200 in attrition. Are you back filling them? Uh, we are. We are. Our academies, uh, we just graduated one last week. Uh, we're continuing to hire. Mm -hmm. uh, we're doing uh, everything we can to restore. We. I, I will say this. I mean, I'm not quite sure there's a lot of places when we talk about support. Uh, our mayor, city council approved us to hire 500 officers in the next two fiscal years. Uh, and so in addition. Uh, to get, yes, and to get to a hopeful 3,200. Now, obviously with the attrition we have, yeah. you know, we're, we're going to, we're going to catch up and we're starting to catch up. Sheriff Dart, same questions. Um, we are having a greater difficulty than the chief is. Um, do you think some of that has to do with maybe the uh, positions that, uh, outside organizations, elected officials have taken towards police? There are, that, that factors in, There's it's complex, but I can tell you within the Chicago Police Department, which is not my jurisdiction, but within my county, yep. having horrible times with uh, many more retirements than they are. And fewer able. recruits. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh God, yeah. And we're having the same problems, but on a smaller scale. Do you think some uh, who have suggested over the last year or two that uh, the Cook County in Chicago needs uh, fewer police is a good idea? Oh, it's it's an awful idea. I mean, and it always was. And I can just tell you, Chicago, rightfully so, gets most of the attention. But the 130 suburban areas that I also have in my um, under me, uh, they're desperate. There's entire departments where I have to do multiple shifts because they have no police officers yeah, at all. I think I think there are spillover. I live in in the uh, Charlotte suburban area, and I'm in the Huntersville Police Department. They're looking for recruits, and actually, interestingly, they're advertising and. Washington State, a number of other places, and getting a flow over uh, to an area where I think public officials are more kind towards law enforcement officers who are putting their <clears throat> lives on the line. Mr. Bozella, do you believe the car industry needs to uh, actually step up and become a part of the solution to the problem of carjackings? Well, we, we do believe we can be part of a broader solution. But do you think it's your problem? Uh, we're, we're here to be part of a broader solution. How many cars are on the road right now that would never have the technology that would go into a car, let's say, two years from now? Well, many. Millions. Uh, yeah, there so are. if we focused on that, would we more likely just see more chop shops filled with cars that were dated at a time that, that wouldn't take advantage of that technology so we'd only be benefiting people that can buy a new car? Look, that's an issue, right? Yeah. We've got to, we've got to sort issue. through the technology. I was a speaker, the Speaker of the House in North Carolina. We focused a lot on chop shops, and they go after spare parts. They go take a car that's a little bit more dated. People are not buying cars as frequently now with the economy going the way it's uh, going. There are more people are buying used cars. I think you're going to always evolve your technology. But for us to think that that's a primary objective to reduce carjackings, I think misses the point. The point here is we need to do a better job of of bending the curve on crime. Carjacking is just one of them. Murdering, murdering police officers, uh, uh, making communities less safe, I think is where we should spend 
uh, the majority of our time. And always expect the industry to get more sophisticated. You're going to do that anyway because it's going to make the product more attractive to the people who are going to buy the car, but not necessarily put you at the tip of the spear. Um, uh, Chief Garcia, to what extent in Texas do you think the fact that we had a fourfold increase in illegal crossings and an unprecedented number of gotaways that are evading Border Patrol has made Texas communities less safe? Well, I'll say, Senator, obviously, when we have the criminal element that is doing that, it makes us less safe. Mm -hmm. I will tell you that in the city of Dallas, we have far more citizens of uh, the city of Texas, documented citizens that are committing crimes more than undocumented. Mm -hmm. uh, but having said that, one thing that we need to do, not just in the state of Texas, but uh, throughout the country, and there's other states, uh, one that I came from, that needs to do a far better job of holding individuals that have committed serious or violent crimes accountable that are here illegally. Uh, and that is something that needs to get worked on. I, um, you know, I think that the, the concern I have, for, particularly for Hispanic communities or, or other ethnic communities, because we know that there are a number of people coming across the border from countries actually in the other hemisphere, um, but I think that the criminal element that crosses the border is most likely to go into communities that look like them and exploit those communities and make them less safe, much more so than my community, maybe. Do you agree with that? I would agree in that. Um, Mr. Chair, I know that I'm the last one to speak, so I'm not going to take any more time. I may have some questions for the record. Thank you all for being here. It's a big panel, so there's no way I could get a question to every one of you. Thank you all. Thank you for your service. Thanks, Senator. Tell us Senator Ossoff is online. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, you'll have to forgive me. My time is brief as I'm between a couple of meetings, but I wanted to make sure to address this issue. Uh, Sheriff Dart, uh, Atlanta police have warned the public about bump and rob carjackings, uh, where suspects pur purposefully bump into drivers to lure them out, attempt to steal their car. Um, what is your guidance for drivers in Georgia and across the country who want to avoid this kind of attack? And, and what steps do you think communities can uh, take in order to reduce the incidents. Yeah, thank you, Senator. We we put a list of things online and did a press conference announcing it for people to make themselves less likely to be victimized. And there's a slew of them hitting all the different scenarios. But the one in particular you bring up is very real. Um, in that scenario, we have told people that a call 911. Most people have their phone, uh, but also try, if possible, go to well lit areas. Go to uh, uh, police station if it happens to be close, but uh, it, it is a very complex par uh, problem because people feel as if they're going to then be subsequently charged for leaving the scene of an auto accident. Um, so calling local law enforcement right away is helpful. Well lit areas really helpful, but but they do need to move beyond that location where they're at at that point because they will be targeted. Thank you, Sheriff Dart. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Senator Assoff. Uh, Senator Whitehouse. Thank you. Um, we've had some experience in Rhode Island with uh, community violence prevention programs. Um, one run by our Center for Nonviolence is called the Street Workers Program. And it finds people who may have had some experience with street crime and um, are certainly known and active in the community and um, ties them up with the police department so that they can provide what you might call early warning systems and also if it looks like something that is very provocative has taken place, to be able to reach out into the community and try to defuse tensions before further violence takes place. Uh, our experience has been very successful. The Providence Police swear by their relationship with the Street Workers Program. And I wanted to, um, I guess, Sheriff Dart, get your opinion on whether the positive experience that the Providence police have had with this sort of community nonviolence program has been replicated elsewhere? Are we an anomaly or is this a fairly uh, consistent pattern of success? There's different variations of it going by different names. Uh, in our area, there's one called Operation um, Ceasefire. Um, and it, it works well when you have that partnership. Some don't have that partnership with law enforcement. They're somewhat 
independent operators, and they would suggest that that is the only way they have credibility on the street, that if they're seen as working too close with police, then they, their sources will dry up and they won't be able to intervene. We've been doing a variation of that within our jail where we work with people who we have identified as most likely to shoot or be shot. We, we work with them in the jail, and then when they leave, we connect them to community providers, and we've had remarkable luck making sure that they're not shooting people or being shot themselves. Um, but those interventions on the street are very critical. Historically, the data has been tricky. It's been tricky because at times, sometimes people will look at the dip in crime in an area and, and say that was due to us when there's many other factors. But we have found that those interventions, like you're talking, are, are phenomenal. The one where it's connected to police is, is really great. It's hard to get that, that, that connection, though. The other one that we've worked on and that... Um actually ended up in a federal law because of a partnership with Senator Cornyn was to look at people who are incarcerated. You mentioned people who are in jail. Look at people who are incarcerated and prepare them better for release back into society, including things like uh, medication-assisted treatment if they have uh, narcotics uh, addiction problems. And um, the result we saw from that was really profound, first in terms of less mortality from um, overdoses in that population, huge drop, like 60, 70%. But just generally, when there's better accountability and better support for people going back into the community, it was associated, at least in Rhode Island, with lower crime rates, um, as well as these more specific um, statistics about less op opioid uh, overdose death. And I just wonder if you had a, a comment on that from your experience as well. We're doing the exact same thing, Senator. And I often will, will tell folks, when you're operating in jail, anything less than what you're talking about, what we do, you should get out of the business. You shouldn't be doing it. Uh, two things. One, we train people who we uh, identify at intake with opioid issues, and then we train them how to utilize naloxone. And so when they leave, they get two naloxone kits. When they leave, they utilize it all the time because when they come back into custody frequently with us, we'll interview them and find out how often it was used. But we connect people with particularly opioid issues with providers out in the community. And the notion that someone who has all these issues has been brought into jail, we know he's going back to the community he left. The notion that you just open the door and let him out the door and things are going to work out real well, it's the heart of the problem. So we case manage people when they leave us with that notion that that's how you bend this curve. And the mental health component of it is the, the easier one, frankly, because we do real deep diagnosis at the front end there, connect them with providers on the outside, and with it, staying, manage them against staying, make sure they stay on their meds. We've seen a tremendous drop on recidivism coming back into the jail and making the communities a lot safer. So the program you're talking about in your community, it's the only way to go. I'd invite... Anybody else on the panel who wishes to respond to those comments as in the form of an answer to a question for the record, to please feel free and, and do so. My time has expired. I would like to uh, tell the chairman that one of the things that we were unable to accomplish um, was to try to get additional support for the localities into which large numbers of people emerging from incarceration go. Um, we have had maps in Rhode Island that show which zip code people are discharged to from our ACI. And as you'll imagine, it's not uniform across the state. Some zip codes have almost zero discharge. Some zip codes have phenomenally high discharge rates. And it's not just following the individual into those communities. It's also supporting those communities as they... Uh, deal with um, the fact that uh, these uh, discharges from the incarcerative system are not evenly spread. So if we can work more on that, that I think would be, that's the one undone piece here. And I thank you for the hearing, Chairman. And I thank everybody for participating. And if you want to add something in the form of a response, written response, please feel free. I'd say to Senator Whitehouse, we could tell you in Chicago where they go, uh, not exclusively, but to a large extent, where ex-incarcerated uh, tend to head home. And uh, those communities, their churches, and organizations that are trying to help them are especially 
hard pressed. We have so many wonderful groups. Uh, Mr. Bryant is here representing one of them. And I, I don't think you've had your day in court. You haven't been able to, I'd like you to conclude if you will, because there's an aspect of what you're doing which kind of bridges some differences which we've heard in this committee. Because you're working not only in community intervention, but you're working with law enforcement in community intervention. And would you please make a record of that again, if you would, please? Yeah, yes, I would. So uh, when Communities Partner for Peace was started, uh, one of our uh, executive directors at our partner organization used to work for the Institute for the Study and Practice of Nonviolence in Rhode Island. His name is Tenny Gross. And we so Tenny well, you've got a hero on your Exactly. Team. So I, I would just say that since the days of ceasefire, uh, we have vastly improved our relationship with law enforcement. Now, it is true that guys who are working on the front lines, on the streets with the highest risk people should not uh, interact with law enforcement because it does reduce their credibility. But the people in management, people like myself, do coordinate with the uh, law enforcement um, on a biweekly basis. Uh, we coordinate with city officials, county officials, state officials, and uh, we play a role in, in ensuring that that coordination is happening. Um, I think the other thing that is worth pointing out is that as uh, our Metropolitan Peace Academy that I mentioned earlier, we train the outreach workers uh, in a 144-hour curriculum, and that has also brought more credibility to the field of violence prevention, and it's allowed for more greater trust with uh, law enforcement understanding our role because they actually contribute to our curriculum. And then the last thing I'll say is that we created what we call a community training academy where it's a community-led training where uh, citizens in a particular police district can host officers for a training so that officers can see that community from the community's lens. And so they get to understand what are the assets in that community, who are the leaders in that community, and what are the challenges from the community's perspective. Because, you know, we agree that we want more law enforcement, but we want better, fairer, more engaged law enforcement. And that for them to realize that as, as a citizen, when I interact with law enforcement, that is something that I probably will never forget. And so understanding your role in the community is extremely important, but we have to rebuild that trust and we're at a at an all time low in Chicago and that, but it's something that we have to, we're gonna be a part of the solution to, to bring that back to bear. Thank you, Mr. Bryant. Thanks to all the witnesses. Uh, I think it was a good hearing. We learned a lot and I hope you were able to teach us effectively and feel that you had a rewarding experience as well. You helped us understand uh, this complicated issue and how the federal government has a role in it and the state and local, local uh, responsibilities as well. Uh, my continued thanks to Ranking Member Grassley for working with me on this issue on a bipartisan basis. The hearing record is going to be open for a week for statements uh, to be submitted. Questions for the record may be submitted by members uh, up to 5 p.m. on Tuesday, March 8th. Thanks again to the witnesses for coming. The hearing stands adjourned.